I want to thank Competition Bureau Canada and Commissioner Matthew Boswell for inviting me to participate in this important summit on competition and growth. Competition policy is economic policy. To me, reforming antitrust law is about rejuvenating capitalism and building a post-pandemic economy that works for all. Canada is America's biggest trading partner and is vividly displayed on the banners which years ago draped the pillars of the Canadian Embassy in Washington. We are friends, neighbors, partners, allies. I remember that well because I may be the only senator who held my swearing-in party um, when I got sworn in a second time as senator at the Canadian Embassy. It's also been an honor uh, to serve as chair of the Canada-U.S. Interparliamentary Group, which for six decades has helped strengthen economies and protect national security on both sides of our 5,500-mile border. I was also a strong supporter of the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, which is providing much-needed stability and economic opportunity to farmers, producers, and consumers on both sides of the border. In fact, at a critical moment where maybe Canada wasn't at the negotiating table, I work with some of my colleagues on the Republican side, and your uh, former ambassador actually held a big a dinner and we hashed everything out and went back and forth and I was so glad that the agreement was a USMCA. My state of Minnesota exports more goods to Canada, 4.7 billion worth annually, than we sell to our second and third largest markets combined. Minnesota's economy is just as interconnected with Canada's economy as it is with those of our neighboring states and much of that ac economic activity is connected to travel and tourism. As co-chair of the Senate Travel and Tourism Caucus, I'm looking forward to helping to restore post-pandemic domestic and international travel as quickly as possible, especially in the Northwest Angle. We want to get the border open. We want to be able to have that exchange and uh, the employees that go back and forth, the tourism that go back and forth. The timing of our recent interparliamentary meeting was important because we are finally seeing a light at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic, or as we say in Duluth, uh, on our beautiful shared Great Lake Superior, we see the lighthouse on the horizon. That means we must fully resume confronting the problems of our time. We know what they are, healthcare, education, climate change, but I wanna focus on one that not enough people are focusing on, and that is the consolidation and rise of market power we are seeing in our, really, our world economy because it's not just the U.S. economy. The rise in monopoly power is an international problem. A recent International Monetary Fund study found signs of rising market power across the economies of the United States, Canada, and Europe. And the pandemic threatens to make this problem worse by hurting the small and medium-sized businesses that put competitive pressure on large dominant companies. Those small companies go away, you don't have the kind of competition you need. During the first few months of the pandemic in 2020, some 22 million U.S. workers lost their jobs. In Canada, more than 1 million workers lost jobs in March 2020 alone. Between February and April 2020, the number of active business owners in the U.S. plummeted by 3.3 million. The pandemic hit small businesses and startups especially hard, forcing thousands to close. In Canada, 58,000 businesses became inactive in 2020. With fewer, smaller businesses, big surprise, we've also seen merger filings increase. There are serious concerns that large dominant companies, which have the financial resources to weather the pandemic, will be in a better position to buy up weakened competitors and become even more dominant. Remember, this was a problem going on before. Many industries, tech, pharma, you name it. The pandemic could threaten to make our monopoly problems even worse. Both of our countries recognize that this is a problem we can't ignore. Canada's government recently proposed increasing the Competition Bureau's budget by $96 million over the next five years. There's a common understanding that we need financial resources. You can't take on the world's biggest companies and make sure that they are existing in competitive markets without having the resources. My own interest in fair competition tracks with America's changing economic landscape. My relatives came to America to work for the industrialists of the Gilded Age. 
My grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the iron ore mines of northern Minnesota, not too far from the Canadian border. He never got to graduate from high school, even though he was a good student, but instead he saved money in a coffee can in the basement to send my dad to college many, many years later. My dad, who we lost last month at the age of 93, earned his journalism degree from the University of Minnesota and went on to be a sports reporter and a newspaper columnist, covering, by the way, the Vikings, and in those old days, Bud Grant, someone that some people still remember in Canada. And my mom was a public school teacher who taught second grade until she was 70 years old. When I was a young lawyer, I worked for a law firm and represented MCI, which at the time was an innovative young telecom company that was being held back by local monopoly carriers. MCI, along with the Republican and Democratic administrations, took on AT&T and ultimately broke up the Ma Bell monopoly, lowering long-distance calling prices for consumers across the country, revolutionizing the telecom industry, and launching a highly successful cell phone industry. Many, including a former AT&T president, have suggested that AT&T's famous breakup made the company stronger because it forced it to become more competitive. As a senator, my work with our nation's antitrust laws started in 2008, a year after I was sworn in, when a pharmacist at Minneapolis Children's Hospital called our office to explain how the price of a life-saving drug used to treat premature babies with heart valve defects had suddenly gone up astronomically from $78 per treatment to $1,600. After I held Senate hearings, worked with state attorneys general across the country and pushed the Bush administration to take action, the FTC and state attorneys general filed suit against the pharmaceutical company that owned the drug for price gouging and violating state and federal antitrust laws. We did that, but guess what happened? We didn't win. We didn't win that case, neither the FTC or any of the parents of the kids or the hospitals. It was a loss despite that huge increase because of the issues with the laws that we're seeing really worldwide. The competition we, prom we face was here before the pandemic. Why is healthcare so expensive? Why are cable rates so high? Why do farmers pay so much more for seeds and fertilizer? Monopolies affect the entire economy. We see it in everything from cat food to caskets. A global problem, and Canada has seen effects in its markets as well. In response to concerns about the market power of big pharma companies, Competition Bureau Canada has joined a multilateral group of global antitrust enforcers from the U.S., the EU, and the U.K. to develop new approaches for analyzing the competitive effects of pharma mergers. Last year, the Competition Bureau hosted a digital enforcement summit to explore strategies for tackling the troubling competition issues that challenge enforcers in Canada and around the world. And just months ago, after it launched an antitrust investigation into Amazon's online marketplace. So these are issues that affect consumers on both sides of the border and beyond. We all know that consolidation isn't good for consumers, but it's also bad for entrepreneurial energy and economic growth. There's evidence that entrepreneurs and small business owners find it nearly impossible to compete in highly concentrated markets. Yes, they can start their companies, but getting bigger is the problem. Widespread monopoly power reduces incentives to innovate and start new businesses that will drive economic growth and job creation in the decades to come. For a strong recovery, we need vibrant, small, and medium-sized businesses poised for growth. That means ensuring that they have competitive markets that will enable them to thrive. To achieve that, we need to update and better enforce our antitrust laws. Don't get me wrong. This isn't about punishing success or going after companies just because they're too big. This is about cracking down on the unfettered growth and abuse of market power, fostering competition, and preserving our capitalist system. I worked in the private sector for 15 years. I want to preserve it. I just want to make sure that it works. Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, as I noted, repeatedly warned of an overgrown standing army of monopolists. We are obviously a long way from the 18th century time of Adam Smith or even the days of Standard Oil's monopoly. But the warning that he gave us is as relevant today as it has ever been. What we need now is a renewed antitrust movement grounded in a pro-competitive economic agenda. 
And in America, all we really need is the political will to get it done. That means coming together to make positive change. And there are signs that this is possible. With Republican Senator Chuck Grassley, I introduced bipartisan legislation to ensure that antitrust authorities have the resources they need to enforce the laws on the books. Our Merger Filing Fee Modernization Act passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee last month on a voice vote. And we are working to further advance the bill. Actually, I think it's passing this week. That's going to give over $100 million um, to the FTC and the Department of Justice Antitrust Divisions so they can take on the biggest companies the world has ever known. We also need to update our antitrust laws. That's why I've introduced the Competition and Antitrust Law Enforcement Reform Act to strengthen enforcement against monopoly power. This bill will reset the baseline for agency funding to enable more effective enforcement. We have a serious problem in that the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division and the FTC are shadows of what they were in the 1980s, even during Ronald Reagan. As Canada has recognized with budget increases, our enforcement agencies shouldn't have to take on those big companies with duct tape and band-aids. We need to get them the funding they need. The second thing my bill does is to update the Clayton Antitrust Act's provisions on mergers and acquisitions to stop harmful consolidation. It changes the legal threshold to prohibit anti-competitive mergers from mergers that may substantially lessen competition, a higher threshold, as interpreted by the courts, to mergers that may create an appreciable risk of materially lessening competition. And it shifts the burden of proof for several categories of mergers, um, including mergers that significantly increase market concentration, acquisitions of nascent competitors by dominant firms, and mega mergers worth more than $5 billion, so that the merging parties would have to establish that their transaction would not risk materially lessening competition. Finally, my bill reinvigorates enforcement against anti-competitive conduct by outlining exclusionary conduct that presents an appreciable risk of harming competition placing the burden on the dominant firms to prove that their exclusionary conduct does not threaten competition. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we need to act with urgency. This crisis has reshaped global economies in a way that scholars will be trying to understand for years. But the focus of policymakers should be laying the foundations of economic recovery, and competition is at the heart of that. Competition brings us lower prices, innovation, improvement in products, forcing companies to pay workers fair wages and improving worker conditions. And it's competition that provides opportunities for entrepreneurs. I'm eager to work with our Canadian partners to foster economic growth and recovery as we look toward the future beyond the pandemic. Thank you, everyone.